be uh, here seeing how great this church has uh, grown, what it's, come, what it's become. As Pastor Thompson mentioned, I've known Pastor Thompson and Miss Sherry for uh, like six or seven years before he was Pastor Thompson. And uh, I saw him, you know, start this church, you know, as, a, as the, uh, the satellite leader and then as the pastor. And um, I've always been curious exactly how it turned out. Now I know, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's exceeded my expectations. It's, it's really great up here. So... Um, it's good to see all the, all the good folks out. So I appreciate you coming out uh, tonight or this afternoon. And I want to preach to you tonight about um, not losing your focus in the Christian life. You know, it's sometimes when you're guest preaching to a church that has, that has a well-fled uh, flock, it's kind of hard to think about or come up with an idea. You know, what, what are you going to preach to to a church that kind of is getting taught everything? And, you know, you, you, the temptations often as a, as a preacher is to, try to come up with some, you know, newfangled thing and wow everybody and, and you know, but then you might slip and fall and, and find yourself in some kind of rank heresy and, and you know, not have a job when you get back to Phoenix or something like that. So, you know, um, I said, that's probably not a good idea, right? So, and I said, uh, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just try and preach uh, something that's encouraging because after all, you know, we're going to go uh, do a great work this week and I really just want to inspire people. And I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir a little bit because I'm going to touch on soul winning. I'd from what I understand, you know, everyone in this room is a soul winner, and everybody's, uh, you know, serving the Lord in, in, in that way. So, uh, but, you know, that can change. That can change in an individual's life. That can change in a church's life. You know, people can uh, be on fire for the Lord one day and then fall away on another. Uh, that's something I've seen time and time again. You know, that wouldn't be the first time it happened. So I thought, you know, I just might as well preach something that's going to encourage the people to keep doing what they're doing, and that's why I've entitled the sermon, Keeping the Main Thing the Main Thing. You know, sometimes a church just needs to do more of the same. You know, sometimes you don't need to change anything. Everything's good. Of course, we can always improve, but we should never let the things that are most important begin to slip. And we'll talk about that, what those things are, in a little bit more specifically later. But, you know, this is a real danger because it's real easy to lose focus in the Christian life. You know, especially in the world that we're living in today, especially in the year that we're living in this year, right? I mean, there's just been so many things that have taken place in this year um, that could just be, you know, an, an, a distraction, you know, an unpleasant distraction. Of course, you know, the COVID-19, that's probably the biggest one. That was a huge distraction for a lot of people. A lot of people, I feel like, lost their focus on, on serving the Lord and got so fixated on, you know, these issues surrounding COVID-19 that, you know, uh, that, that's a real possibility to get distracted by things like this. What about all the riots that took place? You know, some people get real caught up in that, keeping up with the news cycle. Uh, but how about the fires, right? All the fires that are taking place. We can get really distracted by a lot of these things, you know, the economic gridlock that we've been experiencing, the upcoming elections. You know, some people are going to get really distracted by that. They're going to they're gonna get real into, you know, supporting their political candidates, and they're going to leave off, you know, some of the things of God. They're going to skip their, normal, you know, their morning Bible reading and turn on the news to see, you know, which a candidate is in the lead today or, or whatever. You know, how about the protests this morning? And congratulations, by the way. I'm glad I was here for your initial protest. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd like to take credit for that somehow. But I know that's not the case. You know, I'd like to think that, they, that the, 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 uh, the reputation of faithful word has preceded me. But I, I think, I think you've got your own reputation going here with Pastor Thompson. So... So he gets all the, all the credit for that this morning. He, he worked on that. But uh, that can be a real distraction, too. And, you know, Pastor Thompson's right. These people are implacable. They're going to be back. You know, if they're not back next week, if it's not this bunch, you know, it'll be another one. You know, he said, Jesus said, marvel not if the world hate you. You know, and if you hate you, know that it hated me first. You know, and the servant is not above his master. So you can mark it down. As long as you keep preaching the word, as long as you keep, uh, you, know, stand, you know, sticking by the stuff, there's going to be more protesters if it's not these ones. You know, and that can become a real distraction for people. People can get real fixated on the fact that there's, you know, these, these freaks out here doing whatever it is that they're doing, you know, and they can become so fixated on that, they can forget about the fact that once you get through the doors, once you get in your seat, you know, it's, it's business as usual. So don't let that be a distraction to you. You know, stand behind your pastor and, and just keep doing what you're doing. But there's a lot of things that can distract us. I mean, just this year alone, there's been so many of these major events that can be a real distraction for us. It's important that we don't lose focus. I mean, even the world just in general, you know, just, just, just generally speaking, all the other things we talked about so far aside, you know, can be a very distracting place. I mean, you think about all the amusements that are out there, all the, you know, the, the, just the, the, the hobbies and the activities that people get involved in. Look, I've seen people go overboard. I'm not saying it's bad to have an activity. I'm not saying it's bad to have a hobby. 
In fact, I know some people should probably get a hobby, right? <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you know, we can let our hobbies and our activities take over. You know, people get so into doing this activity or so into doing that activity that, you know, the Lord kind of takes a back seat. You know, serving God is kind of becomes like something that they'll try to fit in their schedule. They don't keep the main thing the main thing. So, you know, this year's been distracting. This world is distracting. And, you know, even life itself by just the nature of life is very distracting. And these are things that, you know, we have to tend to. These are things that we have to focus on to some degree. You know, we have to focus on our families as moms and dads. You know, we have to focus on our careers and the homeschooling. You know, we have to focus on church, getting out and supporting the pastor and, and serving the Lord in local church. We have to focus on those things, but, you know, we shouldn't let those things override the main thing in the Christian life. And that's why we're admonished. If you would, keep something in Mark chapter 12, but go over to Hebrews chapter 12. Keep something in Mark. We'll come back later, but go over to Hebrews chapter 12. You know, we're, we're, we need to learn to keep the main thing, the main thing. We have to focus in the Christian life. And, the, you know, the, the proof of that is the fact that we're admonished so often in the New Testament to do that. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be, uh, be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. And, you know, probably nobody in this room has to worry, would have to worry about that and say, look, I'm not going to get involved in surfeiting and drunkenness. You know, I've kind of gotten over that. You know, but what about, he went on and say, and the cares of this life. You know, even the things that aren't necessarily sinful, the things that might even be just be pleasurable, or just the things that are, you know, our basic duty, our responsibilities as adults to do, even those things, the cares of this life, can become a distraction to us and take us away from, you know, keeping the main thing, the main thing. He said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And I love that illustration he used, and every time I think about it, I think about when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old, and we had a, a living in Michigan, we had a big front yard, and, uh, and uh, I had to mow the, mow the yard, and I remember uh, being taught, you know, how to mow nice straight lines. Because, you know, when you, have a lawn, when you have a lawn, you want to make it look nice, impress everybody that drives by. You don't want these wiggly lines going all over the place. When you have a nice long lawn like that, you even get fancy and do the cross cut, you know, and then people are showing up with their golf clubs and things. And <laughs> anyway, that's, that's another story. But I was taught how to have nice straight lines. And the trick is, you know, when you're mowing the lawn, you don't just look right in front of the mower. You know, you don't look right in front of the plow when you're plowing. You know, Jesus uses, you know, a similar illustration of the plow. If you want nice straight furrows, you know, make the most use of your land, you have to keep, you know, you don't look right ahead of the instrument that you're using. You don't look right in front of the plow. You don't look right in front of the mower. You actually look where you're going. You know, you look ahead, and that will keep you straight. And Jesus is saying here, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, you know, getting distracted by looking around at the things that are going on in the world, the things in our life. If we spend too much time focusing on those things, don't be surprised, you know, if, if at the end of your life the, the furrows are a little crooked. Maybe you weren't as efficient as you could have been with what God gave you. Near there in Hebrews chapter 12, this is a very familiar passage, but uh, we'll read it again. It says in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Where is it that you should fix your eyes this afternoon in order to have that straight furrow, in order to have, you know, that, to use that plow efficiently? You know, you should have your eyes straight ahead. You should have them looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to, we need to make the main thing the main thing in the Christian life. Because here's the thing, when we become distracted, when we start to look around, you know, we, we do not prior prioritize what matters most in life. I mean, there might even be things that have, you know, uh, you know, real value, things that we need to be doing, things that are important, but if we put them, at, we get them out of order, you know, in, in our priorities, then you know what, the, thing, the most important things, you know, can begin to slip, can begin to fall behind. If you would, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. So what's the main thing? What's the thing that matters most in the Christian life? You know, we could probably get several different answers. You know, people would say, well, Bible reading is the most important thing. You know, and Bible reading is real important. You know, soul winning, that's the most important thing, and it is, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. You know, say, well, church attendance, that's the most important thing in the Christian life. Those are all very important things, but you know, I, I would submit to you that it's not the most important thing. Because the most important thing in the Christian life is loving the Lord. Amen. I mean, loving the Lord God. Look, if you love the Lord, all those other things are going to fall right in, right in line, right where they need to be. If you make God first in your life, if you look unto Jesus, you know, the Bible reading is going to fall into place. The soul winning is going to fall into place. The, uh, uh, you know, the church attendance is going to fall into place. 
But it's when even those good things that we should be doing, we make those the main thing, and we don't take our we take our eyes off the Lord, we'll forget why we're even doing it. Amen. We'll say, why am I reading my Bible? You know, why am I going to church? Why am I going soul winning? Well, if you keep the main thing the main thing, you'll understand you're doing all those things because you love God. Amen. If you look there, and you're in Deuteronomy 11, I'll read to you from uh, Deuteronomy 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And it says in verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. He said, Thou shalt. That's a commandment. Yep. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Loving the Lord is a commandment. And it's the most important commandment. You know, that's what we read in, in Mark 12. But if you look there in Deuteronomy chapter 11, look at verse 1. He said, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his commandment, his charge, and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments always. So notice there, he says, therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. There's that commandment again. But, you know, we, we often talk about love, you know, uh, people say things like, you know, well, love is just, a, you know, it's a feeling, an emotion, and that's true. But then some people will say, well, no, love is just, you know, it's just a, it's, it's an action, it's a doing. You know what? That's true also. The thing is, they're both true. You know, love is a feeling, love is emotion, but love also inspires people to action. You know, if you really love somebody, you're going to do nice things for them. You're going to help them. You're going to care about them. You're going to, you know, be concerned with the things that they're concerned about. That's why it says here in Deuteronomy 11, verse 1, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and... He didn't just put a period there. He didn't say, thou shalt love God. And then that's it. You know, as long as you just have that warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart, you know, as long as you just wake up in the morning and you just tell God you love him and then just live however you want and do whatever you want, that's good enough. That's not what he said. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. That's important. But he goes on and says, and keep his charge. You know, and, and he goes on and says, and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments, always. You know, it's not like something you're going to do some of the time. You're going to do this all the time. You know, if you really love God, and you're going to obey this commandment, you're going to keep his charge. You're going to keep his statutes. You're going to keep his commandments. You're going to get in the Bible. You're going to read it, and you're going to apply it to your life. And actually, and you're going to say, hey, whatever this book says, that's what I'm going to do. You know, the pastor gets up and preaches something, you know, kind of rubs you the wrong way. You know, and you, you got to just go with it and say, well, if I love God, if you love God, you're going to keep that charge. You're going to keep that commandment, even if it goes against the grain. You know, my old pastor used to say, if I'm rubbing the cat the wrong way, the cat can turn around. You know, and that's, you ever, you ever pet a cat the wrong way? Man, they hate that, you know. Try it if you got a cat at home. You've never done that, I'm, you know. But don't come to me tomorrow belly aching if, if you got scratched up doing it, right? But sometimes, you know, we in the pew can be like that. The pastor gets up, and we, we want him to just scratch our chin and tickle our ears and just kind of, you know, stroke the fur the right way and make us purr and send us out, maybe give us, you know, some, some friskies on the way out or something like that, because we're our Baptists, right? But here's the thing, you know, if you're going to, if the, the pastor, like the pastor that you have is, is going to continue doing what he's been doing, you know, preaching the whole counsel of the Word of God, you know, sometimes that's going to rub the fur the wrong way. Sometimes you're going to come to church, you're going to hear something go, ooh, that didn't feel so good. But you know what? You're the one that needs to turn around. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? If you love God, you'll do that. If you keep the main thing, the main thing, loving God, you're going to go right along with whatever the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, the charges are. And you're going to do it all way. It's not just going to be you're going to be a season in your life where, you know, I went to church for a few years. I tried it out. You know, I, was, I cleaned up my life. You know, you have to just settle it in your heart. Look, I'm in this for the long haul. Amen. Whatever it takes, whatever, whatever comes my way. And God will bless along the way. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Look, it's a commandment that's just all through Scripture. We can go to several other passages in Deuteronomy alone, and I won't belabor the point. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, and he says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord God, thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him? So notice how the love of God here is associated with doing what? To fear him, you know, showing God you know, you, you, you know uh, having a, a fear of, of displeasing him, you know, or, or letting him down. You know, you, you'll, uh, you'll fear the Lord thy God. You'll walk in all his ways. And it says, and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God. These things are all a package deal. And he says, you should serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, to keep these commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. Look, that's all that God requires of thee. And you say, well, that sounds like a lot. And you know what? But Jesus said, my, bird, uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Right. You know, the world's the one that's got the heavy yoke. Yeah. The world's the one that's got, you know, a you know, grievous uh, burden to be borne that they want to put upon you. Yeah. You know, the devil's way, the Bible says the way of transgressors is hard. Yeah. 
You say, oh, living for the Lord so hard. Oh, you know, going to church and being faithful and, you know, having to keep this commandment, keep myself out of this sin, you know, doing the Bible reading consistently and everything that I have to do. It's so hard. Well, you know what? Sin is a lot harder. You know, and if you keep the main thing, the main thing, those things that you think are so hard in the Christian life would actually become enjoyable. You'd actually get up in the morning and say, I can't wait to read my Bible. I can't wait to pray. I can't wait to go to church and sing the hymns and hear the congregation and fellowship with the brethren and hear the preaching of the word of God. If you love God, if you kept the main thing, the main thing, it would be a pleasure to you and not a burden. So let me just give you some reasons to love the Lord real quick. Just some reasons to love the Lord. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. How about creation? You know, I, I, I like Pastor Thompson's uh, sermon about animals this morning. I thought it was a great topic. I think I got to start thinking of sermons like that that are just more topical about things like that. Talking about the beasts of the earth, you know, that lion sermon, you know, I'm looking forward to that one, you know. So I, I love, but you know, because creation really is a beautiful thing. That inspire, should inspire us to love God. I mean, we believe God created all things. You know, we look around and we see just the, the beauty and the majesty of God's creation. That should move us to love God. You know, I, I come up here and I get blown away by the trees, you know, because we don't really have those in Phoenix. You know, or, or grass, you know. I'm, you, I, I go through, a, I'm, I'm like become a connoisseur of grass in Phoenix because there's so little of it. I'm like, oh, that's some nice St. Augustine. <laughs> you know, maybe one day if I have, you know, own a home and I have some money to throw around in Phoenix and grow, and, and grow some, you know, grow a lawn. I shouldn't say grow grass in Washington, right? But I say if I could grow a lawn. You know, I'm thinking, what kind would I want? Would I like, you know, some Kentucky bluegrass, or you know, I want this, you know? But you know, it's it's what is that? It's God's creation. You know, these beautiful things that we see. You know, we're we're gonna, you know, go uh, hopefully go up to Mount Rainier. You know, God made that. You know, we see the majesty and the beauty of creation. That should move us to love God. You know, that's who you have to understand. That's who you're serving. You know, when you when you serve and love God, you're serving the God that made all those things, that made all those beautiful things that God has created. The Bible says in Psalm 139, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul, hath, no, my soul knoweth right well. I mean, do you know that right well this afternoon, that God, you know, has created, that his works are marvelous? Well, you know what? That should move you to love God. That should move you to keep the main thing, the main thing, loving God. And you know what? And then serving him won't be such a burden. What about salvation? I mean, you're there in 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 10. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Amen. I mean, that, that, if, you know, that alone should inspire you to love the Lord. Right. I, mean, that, I mean, sometimes I just think, why me, Lord? Why me? And you know what? There is no good reason other than the fact that he loves me. And, you know, that's, the same of, that's true of everyone in this room right now. And, you know, even the whole world. God loves the world. And it says, you know, not that God loved us, and not that, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for his sins. I mean, Jesus Christ loved you so much that he, you know, bore the cross, you know, the shame, the suffering, and bled and died and went to hell for us. You know, and, and the truth be told, you know, just being blunt, just being honest, we really are nobody. <laughs> you know, I mean, in God's eyes, you know, he sees us, we're, we're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but, you know, in the world's eyes, we're just, you know, just average people. You know, there's really nothing special about me. But you know what? God did make me. You know, I'm part of God's creation, and I love him for that. You know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, the fact that we have these bodies, these bodies are amazing. You know, and we get to interact with the rest of the creation that he's made, which is also just marvelous and wonderful. But how about the fact that he actually died for you? You know, that should move us to love God more and to keep him the main thing. Loving God, that's the main thing, loving God <clears throat> go over to, uh, well, go over to Matthew chapter 22. How about just the blessing? You know, you get saved, you know, and if you start living for the Lord and you start doing right, you know, it, it, God's so good. It's not like he just saves you and says, that's all you, you know, that's it. You know, I've already done more than enough for you. And that's true. I mean, God could say that. He could say, look, I've done more than enough for you. Right. You really don't have to, and you couldn't, you know, ask much more from God than that. Right. But then he goes ahead, you know, and God's so good, and he just, he doubles down, and, he, and he, he says, well, I'm not only going to save you when you don't deserve it, but I'm also going to bless you along the way. And if we, you know, we, if we love the Lord and we, and we serve him, God's going to bless us along the way. Amen. He said in Psalm 13, verse 5, I have trust in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. And he goes on and says, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. You know, God wants to just pour out his blessings on our lives. And, if, you know, this is something I often say to people to try and encourage them is, 
you know, give God something to bless. It was something my pastor used to say to me. is like, hey, just give God something to bless. And you know what he mean by that is this, is that, you know, stay faithful to the Lord through the tough times, through the good times. If you just stay faithful to God through the highs and lows in the Christian life and you're obedient to, to the Lord and his commandments, you keep his statutes and his charges, you keep the main thing, the main thing, God will bless that. And we have to make sure that we give God something to bless. You're there. Uh, actually, go over to Mark chapter 12. Go over to Mark chapter 12. Keeps up the Matthew 23. We're going to go back. I know I got you flipping around. Mark chapter 12. I'll begin reading in verse 29. You mean to keep the main thing, the main thing. You know, and, and the, you know, the main thing is loving the Lord. You know, and it's easy for me to just get up kind of speak in generalities. You know, you, need to just, you just need to serve God. You know, you need to just, you know, uh, uh, be faithful and keep the statutes and the chargements. You know, let's close in prayer. You know, you can figure that out, right? But I want to make some application. You know, I want to get, you know, specific on at least one point. You know, how is it that we can keep the main thing, the main thing? How is it that we're going to love God? Because, again, you know, love is an emotion. We understand that. But it's, it's action, too. And I want to talk a little bit this afternoon about what action can we do to, to love God. You know, if you love somebody, you're going to be, you're going to, you know, you're going to make their priorities your priorities. You know, husbands that love their wives, they're, they're not going to have this to-do list that, 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 that they ignore. Well, they might, you know. <laughs> but they see it, at least. They know it's there, and they feel bad when they don't take care of it. You know, if the wife really needs something, you know, I'm leaving on this trip, and my wife's like, hey, can you ch change the AC can, uh, filter and clean the battery terminals before you go? And I said, you know, honey, I love you, but you just, you know, you, you got to learn to do those things on your own, you know. <laughs> Why don't you go get a ladder and have little Corbin John you do that? It's time he grew up and be a man. I mean, he's four years old by now, right? He should be changing AC filters and cleaning battery terminals. And the guy would probably try and do it if, if I let him, but that wouldn't turn out well. You know, you know I, I love my wife. You know, I have these feelings, these emotions that I, towards her of love and, and care. But, you know, when she asks me to do something that she needs me to do, then I go and do it. Why? Because I love her. Because love isn't just a feeling, and it's not just action. It's both. So if we're going to keep the main thing, the main thing tonight, if we're going to love the Lord, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to, we're going to love the Lord by, and we're going, to, we're going to show that by doing what? By loving our neighbors. By loving our neighbors. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, look at this. It says, and Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. He's saying, look, that's the, that is the number one commandment. That's the first, right? The first of all the commandments. Like Pastor Thompson said about, you know, uh, the statement analysis. People put things, they list things in order of priority, you know, often when they make statements. And God is intentionally doing this. He's saying, look, the, the most important, that's the first and greatest of all the commandments, is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. He repeats it again. But look at verse 31. He says, and the second is like, namely this. Now, that's, that's some strong language there. He's saying, look, loving the Lord is the number one thing. But then he says, but the second one is like it. It's, it's, it's like a, it's, it's, it's so close, such a close second, it's almost first. It's almost a tie with God, the second commandment. And we'll see why in a minute. He goes on, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Look, if you don't have those two things down in the Christian life, you're not making the main thing the main thing. Those, I, I don't care how, uh, what, how great you are at every other thing in the Christian life. If you don't love God and if you don't love your neighbor as thyself, you know, you're, you're not keeping the main, thing, the main thing. And it's just a matter of time until you burn out in those other areas because you're not doing it for the right reasons. Go over to Matthew chapter 22 if you kept something there. Matthew chapter 22, look at verse 34, where Jesus you know, emphasizes this fact again. It says in verse 34, Matthew 22, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. He's saying, look, the main thing in the Christian life is loving the Lord. And the second thing, the, you know, which is like the main thing, point, you know, 1.1 1 .1 or whatever it is. I don't know how they break those things up, right? 
It's like main thing A, main thing B. It's like they're so closely interwoven, it's practically the same commandment. And we'll see why in a minute. He said it's like unto it. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Now, you can't say, I love God, and then hate your brother. You know, hate your neighbor. Right. And look, let me just clarify, in case you're wondering, and I'm sure you're not, I was amening this morning in this sermon where, look, there are, we know and understand there's people that got in this world that God hates, yeah. and we hate them. Yeah. The Bible says, I hate them with a perfect hatred. Yeah. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Yeah, I hate them with a perfect hatred. Yeah. Right? I hate the enemies of the Lord. We all understand that. Okay, I, don't, I, I know this church is well-versed in that doctrine. I'm not going to go on and on about that. But there are, you know, everybody else, which, you know, I don't know what that stupid sign that lady was holding this morning, you know, you hate 20, or 25% of America is a lot of the, you got your, you need to go back and do some math or something. <laughs> these, these Saudis are not making up that much of the people. I refuse to believe that. One, two, three, maybe, and I'm sure that'll go up over time, but it, it's not a 25% of this nation. They would love to have you think that, but that's not the case. Look, the vast majority of the people in this country are just unsaved. You know, they're just unsaved people. Your neighbor, your brother, the people near you, people in your church, these are the people that we need to love. And if you're going to keep the main thing, the main thing tonight, you're going to love the Lord. How are you going to love the Lord? By loving your neighbor. Because God loves these people. And we understand, again, God doesn't love those people, you know, specifically that we're out there. And those like them. He said, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he, he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can, he, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. It's like John is taking those two commandments from Matthew and Mark and Deuteronomy and putting it together. He's kind of he's giving us a synopsis there of the fact that we are to love the Lord our God and, the, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. He's saying, look, he that loveth God loveth his brother also. He said, I want to keep the main thing, the main thing tonight. I don't want to burn out in the Christian life. I don't want to quit. I don't want to wash up. I want to be in this for the long haul. We need to love the Lord, and the way you're going to do that is by loving your neighbor, by loving your brother. You know, loving your neighbor is, is basically, you know, being loving is like loving the Lord. Why should I love my neighbor? Because you love God. Because your neighbor is made in the image of God. You know, God created those, created, created your neighbor as well. You know, he created your brother, he created your neighbor, he created the lost people around us. He cares for those people just as much as he cares for us. You know, we, we were, because, you know, at one point we were all like them. We were all unsaved. No one's born saved. You didn't grow up saved. You know, God, God loved us when we were unlost, or when we were, we were unsaved, when we were lost, when we were wandering, when we were sheep is going astray. God you know, revealed his mercy to us in Christ, we know we should endeavor to do the same. Amen. And we should love our neighbor because that's how you're going to love God. Well, why should I go soul winning? Why should I, you know, go on these trips? Or why should I care? Why should I try to get out once a week? And look, even if you don't make it on this trip, I'm not trying to guilt anybody that's not coming. I'm like, I'm going to be seeing who's here tomorrow making the main thing. It's not that at all. This is like, you know, these trips are like icing on the cake. You know, this, but here, you know what? It's like gravy, right? You want to know what the mashed potatoes are? This is the mashed potatoes right here. All these soul winning times, you got to listen here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the mashed potatoes, right? The soul winning trip, that's just a little bit of gravy. And you know, the gravy's good. You know, <laughs> if, if, you, if, the, if the gravy boat's within arm's reach, you know, grab that thing. Pour some on there. Get some, right, before it's all gone. Get while the getting's good. But I'll tell you what, there's, you know, the mashed potatoes of soul winning, that's a full bowl around here. And, you know, and you can get the main thing in. So make the main thing the main thing in your Christian life. You know, you want to love God. You want to make it in the long haul. You want, to, you want to keep serving God and not burn out. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because God loves them. Why should I go soul winning? Why should I participate? Why should I get involved in the program? And look, I know I'm preaching the choir, right? But, you know, that's why it's entitled keep the main thing the main thing. You know, people might be faithfully going soul winning, but hopefully they're going for the right reasons. You know, and I, you, of course, you always assume the best that everybody is. They're going soul winning because, you know, they love God and they love souls and they want to see people get saved. You know, they're keeping the main thing, the main thing. They're not going soul winning so they can just, you know, raise their hand and be like, we got two. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you guys count them up like that, like we do on a faithful word. And, you know, how many get soul saved? And, like, people just want to be able to hold up both hands and be like. <laughs> <laughs> it's 22, right? You want to be like, I want to have to take my shoe off. <laughs> 
show people what's up. You know? <laughs> Look, if that's all it's about for you, you're not, you're not keeping the main thing the main thing. I don't care if you have to take both hands, your shoes off, get your neighbor's shoes off, hold them up every week. You're going to burn out. It's not, it's not going to last. You need to keep the main thing, the main thing, loving the Lord, loving God. If you do that, you're going to win souls. Why? Because your neighbor is made in the image of God. Your neighbor is loved by God. And it takes effort, doesn't it? It takes effort to love your neighbor. Look, I've had some neighbors that are hard to love. You know, let me go back to that, that lawn mowing illustration. That house I grew up in Michigan that I had to mow that lawn all those years, you know, when my mother passed away, we ended up living in that house. And uh, our neighbor who had been there for like the whole, my entire time I've lived there, Pat, she ended up moving away. So now me and my wife are living in my, well, the house my mom used to live in and, these, and this young couple moves in next door. And uh, here's the thing about that property. We had this big yard and on this, the yard kind of spilled over. There wasn't like a fence there or anything. It was just grass right under the next yard. Like you could just step, you know, I'm in her yard, I'm in my yard, I'm in your yard, I'm in your yard. And she had this, this shed that was like one foot over on our property the whole time. We didn't care. It was like, you know, we, and, here, and we would mow her part of the lawn, actually. We had this marker. We didn't even know, but we were mowing like, a, a, like a, they had a tiny little lawn. I mean, it was pathetic. It was just this little, I mean, it was almost as bad as the yards in Phoenix. It was just a tiny little lawn. But, you know, part of when we would mow, we'd mow over to this point, and that and was part of her lawn, and then she would mow the rest of her lawn, because we're not going to mow. I mean, look, I love my neighbor, but I'm not going, I'm not going to mow your lawn. <laughs> no, if you need me to mow your lawn, you know, I'm sure Pastor Thompson will do it for you. But, uh, <laughs> but the, you know, we, that's the way it was for years, okay? And then this new couple moves in. And I, so I go out one summer afternoon, I mow my lawn up to where I've always mowed it. This guy, and I'm not bitter about it, this guy goes out there, and he mows the lawn, and he, I'm not kidding, he leaves a four inch wide strip of grass, like this tall. <laughs> He's like, I'm only mowing to there. Now what? And I'm just like, man, I just wanted to go over there and be like, listen, new guy. <laughs> Here's how it works around here. <laughs> I've been mowing this lawn for a long time. This is where we mow to, neighbor, right? And I, you know, I had to fight that. I had to be, you know, I could get in the flesh. You know, this is just one example. You know, you probably could think of one too, where your neighbor or some coworker, or maybe even a spouse, who knows, you know, or, or a sibling or a friend or someone at church did something that just, uh, just got to you, right? And you just thought about it day in and day out. You're laying in bed, just thinking about how you're, what you're going to say to them, how you're going to say it, you know, and just, you know, you're talking to other, you know, you're talking to your wife or your husband about it. You know, and I'm sitting there with this. We had a little bit of a Mexicali standoff with that strip of grass. I'm not going to lie. It got tall. You know when grass, like, starts to bloom, you know? And then it came, it got to the, I think it got to the point where it's like, I got to mow the rest of the yard again. And I was like, well, I guess I'm the one mowing that strip. And I just did it. You know what? And, and my, the portion of lawn that I mowed got that much bigger. And that was it. But I walked around for just, you know, days. I want to say weeks, but that's probably not true. But you're know, just walking around, fuming, angry you know, hating my neighbor in my heart over this much grass. You know, silly things like that. Look, we have to love our neighbor. It's a commandment. If you're going to keep the main thing, the main thing, you have to love God. And if you're going to do that, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. And that might mean having to just, you know, fire up the lawnmower and just go on, you know, putting in that extra little bit of work. Or having to put up with some stupid thing that they do or they say something mean or having to just, you know, extend an olive branch in some way. You know, loving your neighbor, it sounds nice, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. <clears throat> so you need to learn to love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because your neighbor is made in the image of God. Your neighbor is loved by God, and it takes effort to love both the, the Lord and your neighbor. Did I have you go to 1 John 3? If you're there, look at verse 16. It says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, and this just goes back to what I've been saying the whole time in the sermon, is that, you know, there's loving in word, but then there's also loving in deed. Yeah, it actually takes effort to love people. You know, one of, the, one of the examples I always think of is, is moving people. Who here hates moving, right? Don't you hate having a pack? You know what's worse than that? Moving somebody else. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Because you don't get the pleasure of unpacking it all and putting everything in its place. You know, it's not like a bird. It's a, it's not a relief for you. You know, it's just like, hey, help me move all the stuff on Sunday afternoon, or, or Saturday afternoon, or whatever, and then uh, that's it. You know, and you can do it again later when I move again. That's like the worst feeling. But you know what? It's sure nice when you're the one who needs help moving, isn't it? You know, I've had to move on my own more than once, and you know, I I think I've learned to swallow my pride, just ask for help from now on. Because it wasn't easy, and that's a whole other story that I don't have time for. But look, loving, your, keeping the main thing, the main thing, you're going to have to love the Lord. How are you going to do that? By just saying it? By just saying, oh, I love God. You know, and the Bible says, if any man love God, the same is known of him. And it's not because of the things he says. That person says, look, you can tell if somebody loves God, not by what they say, but by what they do, by the deeds that they perform. You know, you know you got somebody who loves God, when they're, they're willing to go soul winning whenever, you know, they, they, they get their soul winning in, and they don't care whether the neighborhood's receptive or not. Amen. They're just glad to go and serve God anywhere. Amen. They just want to go and do uh, what God has commanded them to do and preach the gospel to every creature. Because <clears throat> here's the thing. That's the greatest need in this world today. And I'm going to wrap it up here, but that's the greatest need in the world today is to preach the gospel. And look, I know you, everyone in this room here understands that. I know this is a soul-winning church, but you know who's got the main thing down, loving God and loving their neighbors, preaching the gospel. But I'm here to encourage you this afternoon to keep the main thing the main thing. You know, it would, it would be a real heartbreak to hear, you know, if I were to, Pastor Thompson, you know, if, if he ever invites me back up here again for some reason, right, and says, hey, come check out the church and say, hey, well, great, let's go soul. And, oh, we don't do that anymore. That would, that would break my heart. That would be a sad thing. Is that possible? It could happen. You know, if we don't keep the main thing, the main thing. The greatest world, need in this world today is preaching the gospel. They need to hear it. If you would, go over to, uh, go over to Psalms chapter 126. Psalms 126. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, he said, he said uh, this guy asked him, he said, Then send one unto, the, unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? You know, Jesus could have just given him the short answer. Yep. Yes, that's correct. Affirmative, right? <laughs> he said, Lord, there are few that be saved. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. It's an interesting answer that he gives. He says, Many shall, shall say, well, uh, I say unto you, will seek to enter in. But we don't want to get this calloused, hardened idea that, you know, the whole world's just going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing we can do about it. They just want, it. They just want to go to hell. You know, th that's, not, that's not what Jesus said. Yeah. He said there are many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Look, I'm telling you, there's people out there today that want to enter in. They're seeking. You know, if someone would just come and knock on their door, talk to them at work, talk to them at the next family function, just that would take some of these people aside and look for them, they would get saved. And they would be able to enter in. <clears throat> so we need to keep reaching the lost the main thing. You know, keep the main, you know, keep reaching the lost, the main thing in this church. I'm glad it's the main thing in this church. Loving the Lord, loving the lost, reaching. You know, I see your map over there. I noticed that when I walked in. I love watching it, walking in churches like that. I mean, usually that's like the first thing I look for. Where's the map? And I see the lines getting shaded in. I'm like, yeah, all right. This church has got the main thing, the main thing. Loving the Lord, loving the lost. But keep it that way. You know, don't accept cheap substitutes for soul winning. Because that's what I found out, you know, when I get in a soul winning church, why, why are so many other churches out there that, that, that are forsaking soul winning? Independent fundamental Baptist churches that used to do the old fashioned door to door soul winning, like we do. <coughs> what happened to them? They accepted cheap substitutes. Why did they accept a cheap substitute? Because it's easier. It's a lot easier. And you know what? And there's other motivations involved too. But don't accept cheap, cheap, uh, cheap substitutes, like what? Like street preaching. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a cheap substitute. I'm just going to go stand on the street corner and just yell at passersby. And just get on a megaphone and just run my mouth. And no one, you know, I remember when I first moved to Phoenix and I got a job delivering pizzas at night on Southern, well, you, you don't know the streets, so it doesn't matter. On this busy street corner, right, there was every Friday night at the same time, this guy would just go out there, like, you're, you can't even hear him. You can't even make it out. You're like, what? What did he say? Now it's in the light's green. You got to go. But he feels like, oh, I'm just serving the Lord. Just love God. Love the lost. I'm out here every Friday night. Just and he had all these like it was like a Pentecostal church. I think they had all these people behind him just going. <laughs> 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 
You'd be like, like that's serving God. That's a cheap substitute. You know, I'm gonna uh, anyway. I don't want to go off on that. How is about another cheap substitute? Politics. People are just like, oh, you know, I think it's real important. You know, I'm glad you guys are evangelizing and doing that. But it's also very important that we get involved with our politicians. That we go and we go to the state capitol. I had I had a guy recently tell me about how he, he, he there was this ministry uh, in California, like Golden State College. I don't know all the pastors. Like I'm sure I can't remember the names, but if I mention, we might know some of the names. The big name pastors in California, that were involved, you know, in Awake America. So who's ever heard of Awake America? No, we got one person. Okay, so I'm not making this up, right? So this is a thing where they would go. He like and they would go to the capitol, you know, and they would establish relationships with the state representatives. They would go there and say, can I pray for your family? Is there anything you need prayer for? They would just go in. You know, before we started asking or trying to influence policy, we'd go in there and just establish relationships. Well, how did that work out for you in California today? How's that going? It doesn't seem like it's working out too good. Because, you know, like Pastor Thompson told us this morning, I mean, they're, they're legalizing pedophilia pretty much. You know, or, or they're, they're saying, hey, you can't gather than more crowds or whatever. Or they're, they're saying, no more, no more singing in church. You know, how, how, you know, how's that working out? <laughs> Influencing the state legislature. Right. It's, a cheap, it's a cheap substitute for what really matters. It's a cheap substitute for what? The main thing. Yeah. It might look good. It might feel good. You might, might be able to brag about it to somebody years later or whatever. Well, I used to go, you know, or, and do this and do that. Well, how's your soul winning? Well, you know. And the same guy, it was funny because he's criticizing our church for not having a missions program. He's like kind of church, church hobby. He's like, well, you know, the fact that you guys don't have a missions program is a negative. I wanted to like, you ever seen that meme where the guy's like pulling the face open? I wanted to like grab him and just be like, look at the map. Look at the red on the map. There's your missions program. Look at the bulletin. Missions program, missions program, missions program. Unless we're crossing an ocean, apparently it doesn't count. And this is, but this is the type of mentality that's out there. People that are just want to have cheap substitutes for what really matters, the main thing. They say, ah, the main thing, nah. Let's, let's focus on this thing. Look, and if people want to go beat their head on the wall at, at the state capitol, be my guest. I'm not against that. You know, you can come to, come to church and that's your thing, but you, you better be out there soul winning. You better be making the main thing the main thing. How about this one? Don't focus on unreceptive people and reprobates. I won't re-preach the reprobate, you know, sermon we got this morning. We all get that. Why don't preach the reprobates? Because they can't get saved. Because God has given them up. He's given them over. He's given up. We've all read Romans 1. If you're struggling with that doctrine, see Pastor Thompson. <laughs> He'll explain it real well, right? But how about un focusing on unreceptive people? Even those of us that go out soul winning, we can fall prey to this. You ever get that soul winning partner? It's never us, right? It's always our soul winning partner, right? <laughs> you ever that guy who's like knocks on the door and it's just like, when you've been doing it a while, you kind of get a sense of people, hopefully. You could tell that they're not interested but like within two seconds. They're kind of like, <laughs> they thought you were Grubhub or something like that. You know, they're thinking you're like bringing a seven liter burrito. And you're just like, hey, we're from a church. And, just, and their face just drops. And they're like, oh, that's great. And the door starts to slowly do this, like, Close and then the guy's just like, Toom. you know, like just like, hey, hey, well, what if you die? It's like, they're not interested. Yeah. You can tell pretty quick yeah. when people are interested. But some people they just want to, you know, well, you know, they just want to keep beating their head against the door. You know, move on to the next one because there's people that would that are seeking that would enter in yeah. if someone would. I'm more interested in finding that guy yeah. than I'm trying to like just you know beat some guy who's not interested over the head with it. Yeah. Just move on to the next door. Or how about this one? People who want to take these big trips to Israel. I mean, talk about the biggest waste of time. Go, taking a missions trip to Israel, probably one, the most unreceptive place in the world. Amen. Where people are there, there who said, his blood be on us and on our children. Amen. Who spit when they say the name Jesus. Amen. Who don't, newsflash, they don't believe the Old Testament either. Amen. Well, we're going to go and we're going to teach them out of the Old Testament. Good luck with that. Amen. And if that's your thing, you know, go ahead, but it's, it's a waste of time. You know, if they're not going to receive, the, if, they, if they have not the son, they have not the father, the Bible says. But people want to go there and spend thousands of dollars to reach people that are incredibly unreceptive. That's not keeping the main thing. The main thing, that's a cheap substitute. Why? So you can take the photo and then you can tell people how you went to Israel a decade ago to try to reach the Jews because we know everybody just loves the Jews. 
People are falling all over themselves today to do things that are just not the main thing, that are not you loving God. You know, you loving God is going to the place where, you know, and reaching people that, you know, no one's going to be like, oh, you went and talked to your neighbor about the Lord? Oh, man, you're just the greatest Christian ever. You know, that's the main thing, though, isn't it? Amen. That is, you know, but people don't want to do that because there's no glory in it. But here's the thing, you know, there's no glory on earth, but there's glory in heaven. Right. You know, and, you know, we're going to get to heaven one day, and we might not have all the, you know, the pictures of us in Israel. You know, we're, not, we're definitely not going to have the ministry to the homos. You know, we're not going to have, you know, all these worldly, you know, accomplishments, per se. But when we get to heaven, there's going to be some crowns. There's going to be some precious jewels given to some people. You know, and people that are in it for the right reasons, they're going to, I mean, they're going to have bucket loads. There's, there's going to be like a wheelbarrow of people running around with just tons and tons of jewels, right? And I always think about this illustration, you know, there's, because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that, you know, the day shall declare every man's work of what, tri, uh, of what type, sort it is. If, for the day shall declare, for it shall be tried by fire, right? And some people's works are going to burn up, you know, the wood, the hay, and the stubble. And that, I believe, just represents, you know, the things that we have to do to live life, you know, go to work. Those are things that are useful and necessary, but they are not going to yield any eternal rewards. You know, God's not going to, you're not going to get to heaven. God's going to be like, well, did you do it? Did you put any overtime in at work? Oh, you paid your bills? You took care of your family? Oh, you, you taught your kids and, and you did all these things? Well, let me just, you know, load it on you. You know, that's not the case. I believe that's just the things we all ought to be doing. Even the world does that. Even unsaved people figure that out. But, we're, you know, the things that remain, the gold, silver, and precious stone, those are the works that we do for the Lord. You know, and, and part of that is the, 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 precious, you know, the precious stones are the souls. And we're going to get there, and if we're making the main thing the main thing in the Christian life, you know, we're going to have some eternal rewards. But think about this. This is an illustration I think about often. I heard this uh, in, in a church service once. There's going to be some Christians who get to heaven, and all their work's going to be burned up. All of it. No precious stones, no silver, no gold. All they're going to have for all of eternity is just a pile of ash. I think about that often. You know, think about that. You're going to get to heaven. Brother so-and-so is going to just ah, run and buy all these jewels. Sister so-and-so just crowns just stacked up, just jewels hanging everywhere. Where'd you get those? Oh, down there on earth when I went out soul winning Wednesday, when I went out soul winning Thursday, when I went out soul winning Friday, you know, whenever. Just week in, week out, just being faithful. Serving the Lord. Oh, I didn't even know you did that. Yeah. Well, now you know. What do you got there? Oh, just some ash. You're going to be looking around because now you've got to carry ash around for eternity. You know, just like, don't sneeze, you know. <laughs> no, don't move too fast. Just like, you know, I only got this much. Like, or, you better hope there's Ziploc bags in heaven, you know, for your, to, to, to keep your rewards around, you know, your rewards. Don't accept cheap substitutes. Don't focus on unreceptive people. Because they're going to rob you. Let no man rob you of your reward. You know, keep the main thing, the main thing. Loving the Lord and loving souls in this church and in your personal life. You know, don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't just go through the motions without a burden. Did I have you go to Psalm 126? You say, that sounds good. You know, I, I want to do that. You know, and, but here's, and I'm going to do that, but here's, here's the danger. You know, we say, we determine, say, look, I'm going to be there at the soul winning times. I'm marking my, this thing down. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to, I'm going to you know, mark my Bible. I'm going to learn how to go soul winning. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. But here's the danger. Even if you start doing that, a lot of times people can just end up losing a burden and just kind of going through the motions and just kind of dragging themselves out there. And, oh, it's time to go soul winning again. And look, I know sometimes that's just part of life. You know, we have to character is what carries us through the highs and lows. But look at Psalms 126, verse 5. He says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Say, man, I've been going soul winning for weeks, and I just haven't got to say, you know, it might be that's unreceptive. You know, but what, maybe it's because, you know, you don't really have a burden. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not sowing in tears. Well, you know, you're not going out with a burden on your heart. He says, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's a promise in the word of God. That if you go out, you know, and you have a tear in the eye, you know, sow in tears, and you're weeping, you have a burden for people, you're going to come again, doubtless, rejoicing. And it's going to change your attitude, and you're going to bring sheaves with you. You're going to get to heaven and say, look at the souls I saved for you, Lord. Look, I fulfilled the commandment that you gave me to go out and reach the lost. <clears throat> so it might be that maybe the reason why we're not getting people saved like we used to is because maybe we've just kind of fallen into a rut. 
where we're just kind of going through the motions. And that, you know, that could happen, where people are just going out there and just like, well, because here's the thing. If you go to a door or you talk to somebody and you're just going through the motions, they, they can tell. Yeah. It's, just, it's just, it's part of our nature. Right. You, we could all tell when, when we meet somebody, whether they, you know, like us or not, or if they're upset or impatient, like, we could, without even them even saying it. I hear it all the time. People are like, Brother Corbin, are you okay? <laughs> right? I guess I need to work on that, right? <laughs> but they'll sense that at the door, too. You go to the door and you're like, ah, I just, I'm just here because I have to be. Because, you know, the pastor's watching. Or, you know, I, got, I just got to go through the motions. After all, I love God, so I might as well be here. Right? The people at the door are going to notice that. They're going to be like, this guy doesn't care about me. This guy doesn't care. I remember, and this, this, you know, I've seen this so many times in my own life. I've been, I'll be on a drive down to Tucson and, and to, to go do the midweek soul waiting and, and hold the services down there and just start thinking about, man, this drive is so long. You know, it's my job, though. I got to do it. And don't get me wrong, I love my job. Okay, it's great. You know, it's a real privilege to be able to do what I do. But I was, I remember, I, was, I don't know what sermon it was, but I was listening to a sermon by Pastor Anderson. And he was talking about how, about this exact thing, about how when you go to a door, and if you just, you, you, and you don't have a burden for the people that you're trying to reach, they'll tell right away. And the first door we knocked when I got there, this guy comes to the door, I mean, he's just tattooed, just covered, just real rough neighborhood. You know, and he starts to tell me a story, and he's like, he just got out of jail. You know, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people just be like, well, this guy, you know, what good is he going to be for the church? He's not going to profit us anything. He's never going to come to church. You know, but that, I, I thought about what Pastor Anderson had been preaching about, you know, having a burden for people when you go out there. Go out there with a broken heart for the lost. You know, and I had that by the time I even got to that guy's door. I'd already, you know, prayed, got my heart right. And that guy could tell, you know what, that guy got saved. Amen. And that guy came to church. I don't know if it was that night, and he came to a couple services, you know, and, and, and it, praise the Lord for that, yeah. you know. But what if I had just showed him and be like, hey, if you die today, you should go to heaven. All right. See you later. Right. You know, it's, sometimes it's just all over our face. Yeah. I mean, people can just take one look at us and be like, you need to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Something's wrong with you. <clears throat> He's saying here, look, sow in tears, you know, go forth and, and, and with weeping and bearing precious seed. God's giving you the seed, you know, you just have to go with the right attitude. And you will come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with him. And say, well, you know what, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I've been trying to keep the main thing, love God, serve him. But I just feel like, you know, I've been in the soul winning church and I've been soul winning faithfully. And I've kind of gotten in a rut. And if that's you, you know, I would challenge you to go break your hard heart. If you have a hard heart, you need to break it. And I'm telling you, there's nothing that will break your heart quicker than preaching to the poor. And that's one thing I learned, you know, preaching to the, to the Native Americans. You know, uh, we're, we're, I'm sure there's, we're going to be our, see our fair share of it where we're going, you know, to the Yakima Reservation. But um, what, we, what I've seen on the Navajo, I mean, it's, it's rough. People that are, you know, 30% of them don't have running water. They live without electricity. You know, a large portion of the population. Multi-generational housing where grandma is living there with, you know, several generations. Great grandma, kids, the other grandma, you know, all crammed in one house. I mean, when this COVID thing broke out, they were decimated. They had the highest per capita rate than New York, than anywhere in the world for a while. I mean, just tore through that place. You know, but here's what I'm trying to say is this. It, it, you know, if you have a hard heart, go to the, one of these places. Go find some run-down, poor, you know, just drug-infested, place that nobody else cares about in Vancouver or Portland or wherever. Find some reservation. Find some, you know, go to the highways, the hedges, and compel the bad to come in. Amen. Go find out. Go find those people and care about the people that nobody else cares about. Yeah. And you'll start to see things and hear things. I mean, some of the best, you know, some of the best souling I ever did was like the, on some of the worst reservations, the white, white, uh, uh, the White Mountain Indian Reservation. I remember I went out there one time. I took a big team out there. I went soul winning. And I knocked four doors, and every, someone got saved at every one of those doors. And that was like my whole afternoon. This is the most receptive soul winning I've ever done. But I tell you what, at those four doors, I saw some things that, you know, just would break your heart. The first door I knocked, the mom was just proceeded to tell me about how, you know, her, her, her one son committed suicide, her husband committed suicide, and just recently her other son, you know, got beaten to death, literally, on the res. I mean, I, and I could tell you story after story that I've heard on these reservations like that. 
So if you have the heart, you know, if you're going through the motions, you, you know, you're keeping the main thing, the main thing, but you know what, maybe, maybe the love is starting to wane a little bit, go on one of these trips, you know, you know, m motivate yourself to get involved, go on a mission trip, something, go, go somewhere else in the city, go find somebody, the town trodden, you know, the rejected of this world that nobody else cares about and love them Amen. and get your, your focus off yourself. <clears throat> Go over to math or go to Luke chapter seven. I'll, I'll wrap up here real quick, but Luke chapter seven. This always blows me away whenever I read this. You know, John the Baptist is in jail, and he's doubting whether or not Jesus is the Christ, right? And he sends his disciples asking to ask him whether or not he is him, because he's kind of like, well, if you're the Christ, why am I in jail? <laughs> you, know? you know, sometimes in life things don't go the way we expect them, right? right. And Jesus tells him in verse twenty-two. Then Jesus answering said unto them. Go your way and tell John what things he has seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. Look, if we did any one of those things, we'd all be blown away. Look, if we go out of the Yakima Reservation and you people start raising the dead, I'm, I'm going to be wondering if you're not, you know, <laughs> possessed or something. That's going to be really, I've never seen it. I'm not expecting that, right? But that would blow you away, wouldn't it? That was the type of thing that was happening back then. The lame were walking. Lepers are cleansed. I mean, these are just these amazing miracles that are taking place in his ministry. And we would love to see that. But look at the last thing he mentions. To the poor, the gospel is preached. So you have just these lists of these just amazing miracles that any one of us would love to be to behold, let alone perform. But at the very end, he says, but the poor have the gospel preached. I don't think that's a coincidence that he, you know, he, puts, he lumps that in there. You know, it's a miracle when somebody cares enough about the poor to go preach them the gospel. Amen. He's saying it's a miracle that there's people that have you know, enough humility, enough of a burden, enough of a love for God, people who have kept the main thing, the main thing to go out and reach people that nobody else cares about. It's a miracle. It's on par with raising the dead. You know, Jesus said you shall do greater works than these. And he's talking in terms of, of quantity, right? And, you know, it's just funny because sometimes people get so caught up in wanting to, you know, cast out demons or do some, you know, they want to see some supernatural thing. You want to see some supernatural thing, go to somebody and ask me if you can preach them the gospel. Open up. That's a supernatural thing to preach them the gospel and have the Holy Spirit work on their heart and then believe it. It's supernatural. It's otherworldly. It's of God. It's a miracle. <clears throat> and that was Jesus' encouragement for John the Baptist. He was doubting, his heart was getting hard, and he wasn't sure. He said, well, you know what? The poor have the gospel preached. You know, if you're going through the motions, if you're, you're, you're trying to keep the main thing, but, you know, the love is waning, maybe you should need to go preach to the poor. Maybe go find that person that, that nobody else cares about. <clears throat> so we need to learn tonight to keep the main thing the main thing. And what's the main thing? To love the Lord. How are you going to do that? By loving your neighbor. I mean, Jesus said that it's like neck and neck. They're right there. I mean, if you had to take, like, a photo finish, you know, loving the Lord is just, you know, that, that, that horse nose or tooth, you know, like, uh, you know, it's just, just barely won the race, right? They're just right there. These are the two great commandments on which all the other commandments hang. But here's the thing, you know, we need to keep that the main thing in this church because I'm telling you, this wouldn't be the first church to forsake soul winning. It happens all the time. <clears throat> Go over to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll end there, Revelation chapter 2. I mean, all the way back, and even the Apostle John's day, it was already, it was already happening. I'll begin reading in verse 1. It said unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, Write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they're apostles. Look, you know, we got some of that down here, right? Yep. I mean, I saw that this morning, how you cannot bear them which are evil. I mean, there was some evil out there in the front door, and we couldn't bear it. Amen. You know, I had to see that abomination out there twerking, <laughs> you know, in her skin tight, you know, leotard or whatever she's wearing. I, I just instantly was like, I will not vex my righteous soul with this. I couldn't stand that which is evil. Like, we can get that down. You know what? That's kind of the easy thing to do. Is it really that hard to hate wicked people? I mean, it's like, it's second nature. I mean, I understand there are people out there that struggle with it and don't understand that they should. But look, he says, look, I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, I know you can't bear them which are evil, and has tried them which say they're apostles, you know, exposing the people that, you know, are, are putting themselves out there to be something that they're not. And that's a whole other sermon. 
and hast found them liars. And look at verse 3. And hast borne, hast patient for my name's sake, thou hast labored, and hast not fainted. Look, they're doing the work. They're not, they haven't fainted. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're laboring. They're not fainting. And he goes down to verse 4 and says, Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He's like, you're doing all the works, but where's the love? You know, that's something we need to, he's saying, I have somewhat. You know, it's concerning to him. And look, if that's you tonight, you know, if you're going through the motions, you know, you're showing up the soul many times, but the love isn't there, you know, you should, you should understand that God has somewhat against that. And you need to check that. <clears throat> he says in verse 5, remember, therefore, if once thou art fallen, and do the first works. You know, some churches, they just need to get back to that. This, I mean, that's what the Ephesians, they're, they're, they're on the brink of doing, just, you know, not doing the first works, which is what? Reaching the lost. I mean, the, the first work is the thing that, that the, the, the first works is the last things that Christ commanded us when he left. You know, when he, when he began to ascend in front of his disciples and slowly go up into heaven? You know, you know I don't think he, he just did that because, you know, he wanted to look cool. Right? I mean, wouldn't it be cool if just all of a sudden, like, let's wrap up the sermon, and I just started to levitate, you know, and float. <laughs> you know, if I did that, you, you, you might have tuned me out the rest of the whole, up the sermon at this point, but if I did that, you would remember every word that I said as I began to, like, push up against the ceiling, right? You know, I hit my head. You remember when Brother Corbin came that one time? You would remember it for years. You remember a decade ago when Brother Corbin came up to preach, and when he's closing his sermon, he began to levitate up towards the ceiling? Remember what he said? And you could probably tell me verbatim. You know why Jesus did that? He did that when he left? Because he wanted us to remember what he said. And what did he say? He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was, that was the last thing he said. And that's the first work. So there's one, there's one thing I want you guys to do. There's one thing that you're here to do. That's to love thy neighbor. And you know, love me, love the Lord thy God, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, you wouldn't be, this wouldn't be the first church that, first, that, that, that forsook soul winning. I don't, I don't foresee it happening, but it's a, it's a possibility. I mean, it could happen at any church. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and you wouldn't be the first person whose who's, uh, love for the lost waxed cold. You know, if you, if you, if you stop soul winning, you just, you know, kind of fall out and eh, get out of church and just go back to the world, you wouldn't be the first person to do that. I mean, that's what Paul said of Demas. And anyone, and most people know who Demas is. He said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What was Demas, Demas's problem? His love. He left his first love. He went back to the love of the world. He didn't keep the main thing the main thing. So that's all I wanted to do tonight is just encourage you to not get distracted by everything that's gone on this year. Don't get distracted about the things that are probably going to take place in the next few weeks. Don't get distracted by uh, the nature of life itself. Don't get distracted to the point where it takes you away from keeping the main thing, the main thing, loving the Lord and loving your neighbor and reaching the loss. Let's go ahead and pray.